but let's get into the Word of God. If you have your Bible, 2 Kings chapter 8, starting with verse 1. Now, last week we dealt with the story after this one. We're going to go back. And this is an Elisha story in one of the more unique ways. 2 Kings chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Now, Elisha had said to the woman whose son he had restored to life, go away with your family and stay for a while wherever you can because the Lord has decreed a famine in the land that will last seven years. The woman proceeded to do as the man of God had said. She and her family went away and stayed in the land of the Philistines for seven years. At the end of the seven years, she came back from the land of the Philistines and went to appeal to the king for her house and for her land. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity again to delve into your word and to understand you, to understand ourselves, to have clarity on this most important topic. We ask for your spirit to give us insight. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, amen, amen, amen. So the man of God warns her. He warns her. I don't think he warns everybody in the area because most likely the Philistines and the surrounding uh, nations probably could not house all of Israel. But Elisha is specifically looking out for the Shunammite woman, the woman who had shown him so much kindness and building an extension to her home and allowing the man of God to stay there every time he was passing through. And remember what the man of God did. He then prayed for, to God for her womb to be blessed because she had not been able to have children. She was blessed with a child, and then the child died all of a sudden. And she begged and begged the man of God, and he came through raised the child back to life, and she was blessed again with the life of her son. And so Elisha, showing her maybe a little preferential treatment, says, you need to get out of here. There's a famine that is, that is going to hit this land. Get away for seven years. And so she does. She goes to the Philistines. She comes back after those seven years, and there's a little bit of a problem. Some squatters are in her home. Most likely the king has taken over her property. All of those who had left this land, the king has now assumed their debt. He has now purchased their property, and he is most importantly in his eyes, he is now making money on the property. And so this woman then goes to the king and says, King, I have a problem. I left for seven years because of the famine, but when I came back, my home has been taken away from me, and my land has been taken from me. My family is homeless. Please, please, please give me back my property. Give me back what is mine. Now, this is a challenging situation here. Most kings, because of their need for power and money, would never give in to such a request. This is most likely very similar to Luke 18 when Jesus tells a, 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 a parable about a woman, the widow, who goes to the judge and pleads for her rights. Please, please, don't allow them to take away my kids and my house because of my husband's debt. Please, please. And she keeps begging and begging. And Jesus says, finally, the wicked judge gives in to her and says, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. I'll cancel out your debt. So this is a very similar situation. What she's asking for is for redemption. She's asking for her property to be redeemed. Now, most of us are not familiar with, with the more spiritual term of redemption. We've heard it so often, we believe we have an idea of what it means. But to be redeemed means to buy back what is already yours. Redeeming someone is buying back what is already yours. Redeeming your property is to buy back that which is already yours. That's what redemption means. How many are familiar with redeem codes and redeem, redeeming gifts? Anybody? Come on. It always seems like it's free, right? 
oh, if you have this little redeem code, you have this little redeem code, you can get a gift card, you can get more money on this. Well, what they want you to believe is that this is already yours. All you have to do is redeem it. It's already yours. It has your name on it. But if you just scratch off this stuff on the back of the card and input those numbers in Amazon, voila, $25. So we're familiar with it on some level. Now, when I was growing up, I loved toys. Those of you who know me as an adult, and I am very grown, know that I still kind of like toys. I have a collection of toys from my childhood. I am very nostalgic like that. He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, Batman, Superman, Transformers, Star Wars, G.I. Joe, all the 80s people know what I'm talking about. All you kids are like Pokemon and Digimon and... Yu-Gi-Oh, you don't even know what I'm talking about. This was the old school classic, the 80s, the best decade ever. And I'll never forget when I was told back in 2000 that there was this new online auction site called eBay. And someone who overheard me talking about my childhood and how many toys I wanted. And I just wished, I just so wished I could, I could have bought all those toys. I had these toy lists that they, they, that they put in the back of, these, uh, of your toy or this packaging that you pull out this toy list so you can see all the toys you don't have. So you could have a craving for more. And you go to your parents and say, Mom, Dad, <laughs> I want this. So, so I wanted so many toys, and there were so many boxes I checked. One day, I'll get these toys. It never came to fruition. We didn't have that kind of money. But when I accepted my first position of outreach and pastor and campus ministries pastor at Campus Hill Church in Loma Linda, one of my first paychecks went to redeeming my little plastic babies. <laughs> I was going to buy them back. I went online and I typed in the first toy I wanted. It cost me $20 back in the day. I'm sure it probably cost $2 now. I typed in his name. Optimus Prime, the leader of the Autobots. Oh. It cost 20 or something, 10 20s, $200 to buy Optimus Prime. And here's, here's the clincher. It wasn't even brand new. It was old. It was missing stickers. Max, you know about these days because he was addicted alongside with me. <laughs> he still is. We ain't going to talk about another servant. But here's the thing. I'm... I'm I'm looking at it, and I'm told I just have to put in a bid. And if I'm the highest bidder at the end of the auction, I will be able to claim him as my own, reclaim him as my own, because he used to be mine. Oh, boy, I put in, I put in first $100. But someone outbid me. So then it was 130 and someone outbid me again. Ho, 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 ho. Y'all don't know me. I just got a paycheck. It's a spiritual paycheck for pastoring and redeeming. I'll never forget that feeling of thinking that it was going to be taken from me. And I put in one of these astronomical numbers for me at the time. Remember, this is 2000. And, and when it hit zero, my name was at the top of the board. I got him. I got him. I had to pay for it. This was PayPal back in the day. I know PayPal is popular, but this was, this was a new way of paying back then. Or you could send a check, and I'm like, nope, I want digital stuff. I want to track it all. Made the purchase. Gave him my address. Gave me the confirmation code. Gave me tracking. And I tracked Optimus Prime all the way from Honolulu.
When I opened that package, I thought I was 10 years old again. Right? The interesting thing is, I redeemed that which I believe was mine. I paid more for it than it originally cost. And it wasn't even in the same shape. I left it. But was I happy? Absolutely. This woman's property most likely does not look the same after seven years. Probably after several groups of squatters have come through a place to live for free. Her house is probably in disrepair. The king is most likely making money still on taxes and so on and so forth and maybe has servants that are, that are tilling the ground and still farming and able to make money on the produce. But, but at this point, it is no longer hers, but she needs it back in order to survive. The interesting thing is she doesn't have a job. <laughs> The interesting thing is her husband no longer has a job in this land because he was making money most likely through agriculture. And so everything that is necessary for survival is needed at this moment. What they need is the king to be merciful. They want what is theirs and most likely are willing to pay whatever the cost is if they have it. Interesting story. Verse 4. The king just happened to be talking to Gehazi. Gehazi is the servant of, of Elisha, remember? He is the one who came down with cancer because he did not want Naaman's healing to go uh, uh, without any cost at all, without any expense to him. He didn't want it to be free, remember that? And he came down with the dreaded disease that, that Naaman had. Now maybe the timeline is off here because here is Gehazi in the courts of the king and most likely lepers would never be allowed in the courts of the king. So the, 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 the chronological order may be out of whack here. But, 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 but think, think about this. He's talking to Gehazi. He happens to be talking to Gehazi when this woman walks in. And listen to what the conversation's about. The servant of the man of God had said, tell me about the great things Elisha has done. Oh, Elisha probably starts off with a couple of small miracles like the axe head that was floating. Probably talked about the spring waters that had, that had been cured in Jericho. But just as Gehazi in verse 5 was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life, the woman whose son Elisha had brought back to life came to appeal to the king for her house and land. And Gehazi said, this is the woman, my lord, the king, and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. Now, let me ask you a question. What is the likelihood of all of this happening at the same time. You can't just chalk this up to coincidence. Remember when we question why God would bless this woman with a child only to have the child die? a few years later? Remember when we questioned how God could allow us to go through some of these dark moments when he seemingly has blessed us? Remember what we talked about last week, the imagining God creating Lucifer and Adam and weeping, knowing what their future would be and how they would be a part of his death? How could God allow these bad things, catastrophic things to happen in our life when he's the author of good and blessings? And here we have maybe an answer. Just as the story of the miraculous restoration of her son's life is being shared with the king, this is when she and her son happen to walk into the courts of the king. The one judge who has legal rights to her property. The one judge that with just one stroke of the pen can give her everything back. He's hearing a story of inspiration where she and her son are the star. Narrative is important, is it not? The king asked the woman in verse 6 about it. Is this true? Did this really happen? And she told him. Then after hearing this, he assigned an official to her case and said to him, give back everything that belonged to her. Everything that belonged to her. This is what it means to be redeemed. 
I am going to give you back everything that was yours, everything that belonged to her. And watch this, including all the income from her land from the day she left the country until now. Now, that's where I have to say, that's a little bit unfair. You're not just giving her back what was hers. She wasn't around for these last seven years. She abandoned the land of Israel. She was off living with the enemy, the Philistines. You can't give her credit for something she didn't earn. I can maybe understand giving her back her property, redeeming her property, but to give her what she never even worked for. Redemption is a very powerful thing. God not only restores us of everything that we lost, but he can't help himself and he gives us extra. This is the story of Naaman, remember. Only a month ago, Naaman wanted to be cured of leprosy, and he was cured of leprosy, but God went one step further and gave him skin like a brand new baby. No more battle scars. Redemption is a powerful thing, and we need to understand something. Redemption is also a legal term. Redemption is settled in the courthouse. Redemption is decided with legislation. Redemption is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a word that, that Paul knows it's, in, it's, it's between lawyers and judges. This is why he talks about so, so beautifully in the book of Romans about how we're justified, we are acquitted. But why is this narrative so important? Why must we understand this? Because growing up, I never understood why God had to die for us. I never understood it. I never understood it. I never understood why he had to go to the cross. I never understood why it needed to be all bloody. If you're God and you can do anything, all you have to say is, I forgive you. It's all good. Isn't that what God asked us to do with our brothers and sisters? Simply forgive them, not cut off our hands, not break our legs, for sure not nail ourselves to any wooden beams. Why is the story of redemption, what we talked about last week, the plan of salvation that seemingly went awry, seemingly was hijacked, why did it involve a cross? Why did it involve bloodshed? Why did it have to happen the way that it did? John chapter 17 is interesting because this is the prayer before Jesus arrest. And, and what's interesting is that he's praying to his father, and the verse that you most recognize is verse 3, where he says, Father, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And then he says in verse 4, I have brought you glory on earth. How did Jesus bring glory to the Father on earth? God's glory has always been a manifestation of his character. It is always Jesus showing us who God is. That is the, how you glorify God. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Now, now if you notice that word finish, teleos, Jesus says, I have finished the work, Father, that you gave me to do. How many believe that at this point, before the cross, Jesus had finished the work his father gave him to do? How many are willing to say at this point, Jesus had completed everything his father asked him to do? Anybody willing to say that? Most would say absolutely not because you have yet to go to the cross. You have yet to shed blood. You have yet to give your life. How can you say you finished the work your father gave you to do? I am going to say something to you you may have never heard before, but trust me on this. This is in Scripture. The work the father gave his son to do that came from the father, that is his perfect will, that does not involve any sinful cooperation, was always to reveal to people who God is. That's why verse 3 says, eternal life is that you may know him. You may know him. I am willing to say that if Adam and Eve knew Jesus, knew God the way they were supposed to know him, they would have never taken the fruit. That's how powerful the knowledge of God is. 
If you know me, you're going to love me. And if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. This, this, is, this is so emotional, so logical, so rational, so spiritual, and they all come together. If you know me, you're going to fall in love. And if you love me, you will trust me, you will follow me, you will do as I ask. This is why it is so important, even in 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, you don't have to turn there right now, uh, uh, John says that if you continue to live in sin, it only proves that you've never seen God and you have never known him. John is so convinced. So Jesus says, I have finished the work that you gave me to do. Now in the Gospel of Luke chapter 22, Jesus asks them when they come to arrest him in the garden, he says, why are you coming to take me like this? You could have, you could have gotten me in the open. I openly preached in front of you and taught in front of you. I, I was in the synagogues, in the temple. Why are you coming to me as if I'm a criminal? Why are you coming in the middle of the night? And then he answers his own question. I know why, because this is the hour of darkness. This is where darkness is in control. There is a clear distinction between what God had called him to do, what God had given him to do as a mission, and also a very clear distinction between that and darkness. Jesus had a mission of light. I will tell you, I will tell you, Jesus' main mission was to live and to glorify the Father. He spent 33 years living, six hours dying. Just based on that alone, tell me which one was more important. If Christ only came to die and did not live, if he showed up for just 10 hours on planet Earth and said to the Romans, I am the Messiah, I'm a king, they would have strung him up, strung him up on a cross. That's what they did to would-be messiahs. Jesus didn't come to simply die. He came to live so that we may know God. But Satan had other plans. And his plans were to break the Son of God, to cause him to contradict himself, to, to prove to the universe that he was a fraud. There was a work that Jesus had to do that the Father was behind and it was all good. And then there was a work that involved evil and death and blood and jealousy and fear. And that, my friends, did not come from God. Yes, God planned for it, but God did not plan it. I've said this to you before. He planned for it. He knew a cross would be there, but God did not plan the cross. He did not purchase the nails. He did not build the cross. He did not tell Pilate, please, can you read this one part in the script? No one else is willing to do it, but can you do it? We know that God didn't want even Pilate to have a part in it because he sent his wife a dream. And she went up to her boo and said, honey, I suffered many things because of this man. Have nothing to do with him. Right? All the warnings to Peter, all the warnings to Judas. God did not want his people to sin. Every time Jesus was telling the people about themselves, it was an opportunity for them to repent and do better. You want to kill me. No, we don't. So why is this, why is this so important? Listen to what the Bible says here. Let's go to uh, uh, Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He says to the people, you were bought back, redeemed with the blood of the lamb. Not with just silver and gold, not on PayPal, but with his blood, he bought you back. Bought them back from what? Well, it says, from the empty way of life handed down to you. The sinful life that you've been living, the distortion, the, the falsehoods, all of the lies. God bought you back from that, that path that was leading you to death. He redeemed you from that. But listen to Jesus' own words, Matthew 20, verse 28. Matthew 20, verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a what? 
ransom for many. Question, we now know there's money being exchanged. We know that there's blood being exchanged in order to secure our freedom, to secure our lives, to buy us back from, from, from sin and death. Question, who are we paying the money to? Because I know that when I was buying Optimus Prime, I knew where to send the money to. There was a name. He had an email address. And that's where I, I sent the money through PayPal so that I could get my Optimus Prime back. But in this situation, who is God sending the PayPal money to? Now some, depending on how you look at this, this whole entire redemptive story, some would say that, that we are being redeemed from God's wrath. The propitiation of sin. Jesus comes as a substitute for us. That God is so angry with us. And because of our failures and our sinful way of life, he demands blood. We must die. And Jesus says, no, dad, take me instead. I'll die in their stead. I will die in their place. Let me experience your wrath. But don't give it to them. Beat me up. Bruise me, as Isaiah says. Let it please you, Lord, to bruise me. And may my stripes heal them. And the father says, okay, son. But that's not scripture. The Bible says, for God so loved us that he sent his only son. It wasn't Jesus who so loved us. I'm not saying he did it, but it was the father who so loved us that he sent his only son. Right? That's scripture. So, so the father is the one who is paying the ransom. To who? Who? Who is out there demanding our death? Who is out there who wants blood? Who is out there that is a mastermind of, uh, of death and torment? Who wants to see our ruin? The accuser of the brethren. Go with me to Zechariah chapter 3. Oh, we're... We're doing some systematic theology right now. Zechariah chapter 3. This narrative is all throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, Satan has always, the adversary has always stood against us and wanted our ruin and death. Listen to what it says in verse 1, Zechariah 3. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest. This is Zechariah in vision, in a dream, seeing this. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest. Just so you know, Joshua in Aramaic is Yeshua which means Jesus. So here is Joshua, the high priest, and the high priest would represent the people of God. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan what? What did he say to him? The Lord rebuke you, Satan, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now in this narrative, Joshua the high priest is in filthy rags. He clearly has defiled his post and his ministry. He is, he is sinful. He is wretched. And he deserves, he deserves to be cut off. He deserves to lose his position. He deserves to lose the blessing. But it is God who says, no, 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 no. May the God who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. What we don't understand, that in the, in the narrative of the great controversy, Satan has been the one always standing and saying, yeah, but. The story of redemption in many ways is a legal issue. God could simply say to Adam and Eve, if he wanted to, he could say, I forgive you. We know that he forgave Adam and Eve because they did not die immediately, right? And he tells them in, in chapter 3, uh, uh, verse uh, 15, that he would send his son a seed that would, that would squash the head of the serpent. The problem is, in the great controversy, there is a courtroom and there are legal ramifications. See, if, if, if God is not a God of order, then anybody can do whatever they want when they want. 
They can say whatever they want to say, when they want to say it, and there will be no or anarchy everywhere. So law is important. And Satan had argued many times that God's law is arbitrary. He's just, he's just a rule cruncher. He just wants, he just wants to, you to be a submissive. He doesn't care about your freedom. It's all about God and his ego, right? This is what he's been putting out. This has been the narrative. But then God comes around and says, okay, I get to speak for myself. I get to show people who I am. And then you see Jesus, who is God himself on earth. And not even God is judgmental, even on earth, among sinners. Even God is welcoming everybody at the dinner table. Amen? Even God is allowing lepers to touch him. Even God is is working with Gentiles. Even God is working with his enemies and ministering to his enemies. Even before he's crucified, he is ministering to Pilate. Even before he's crucified, he's saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Clearly, God is not who Satan has been saying he is. And this is why this is so important. You guys ready? Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Colossians 1, verse 19 and 20. Listen to what the Word of God says. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him. That means all of who God is was dwelling in Jesus. Meaning if you've seen Jesus, you've seen who? You've seen the Father, right? There's no difference between them. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. The meaning that through Jesus the Father would reconcile all things, all things to himself. Whether things on earth or things where? What? You, You mean that God redeeming us wasn't just about redeeming us? That God reconciling us wasn't just about God reconciling us? No, reconciling all things, whether on earth or where? In heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Who's he making peace with? Who's he making peace with? He's reconciling everything, whether on earth or in heaven. Because I'm going to say something to you right now. The cross has more to do with the universe than it does with planet earth. Newsflash. It has more to do with the universe than it does with us. We're so short-sighted that all we can see is that our kid died. And God, how can you do this? How can you do this? And God says, you don't understand that me allowing your son to die right now is going to redeem for you a future you would never be able to secure had I not allowed this to happen right now. You want to talk about just this moment of your son dying, by the way, that your womb could not produce on its own. It was my gift to begin with. But I've given you a gift that will keep on giving. Had I not given you this son and allowed him to die and brought him back, you would not have been given your property back. You wouldn't have gotten it back, girl. You would not have had it back. But the narrative of what I've done for you will pay back more than you could ever imagine. We look at our world and we say, Lord, how can you allow this to happen? And God says, you can't see the big picture. You're so consumed with yourself. You're so consumed with your money. You're so consumed with your house. You're so consumed with your health that you don't realize that these things that are happening to you are going to, in the end, glorify your creator. Isn't that what Jesus says in in John chapter 9 with the blind man and then again with Lazarus in chapter 11? This man was born blind so the power of God might be seen at work in him. Jesus says, yes, I'm so glad that Lazarus died. That way your eyes will be opened and you will see God. We're so short-sighted. All things were reconciled. Can I, can I do a little bit of reading? Oh, we're going to close. We're going to close. Don't worry. We're going to close. This is from the Desire of Ages. Can we do a little bit of reading? We do a little bit of reading? All right. All right. Just a little bit of reading. All right. And then we'll close up, right? Don't worry. It's been like 30 minutes. It's been, I got up at like three minutes to noon. You're good. 
Listen to, listen, to what the word, listen to what the Word of God says. Listen to what the Word of God. I say Word of God because I believe inspiration works even outside of Scripture. God has a Word that He is giving us. Praise the Lord. I praise the Lord for those who have the gift in writing, those who are continuing to share under the, the direction of, of the inspiration. And I see this as all inspired here. So listen, listen to what she says here. And this is one of the best commentaries on the life of Christ. It's taken from the chapter. It is finished. She says, this is Ellen White, to the angels and unfallen world, the cry, it is finished, had deep significance. For who? <laughs> angels and unfallen world. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. They with us share the fruits of Christ's victory. Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. The arch apostate had so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understand his, understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. Okay, let's do some homework here. Watch this. So Jesus says in John 17, 4, I have finished the work you gave me to do by glorifying you here on earth. I have fully revealed everyone to you, as Colossians uh, uh, 1 says, that God was dwelling fully in Jesus Christ. So now everybody sees who God is. But in this controversy, as in any courtroom, you not only have to examine the character of the one who's accusing, but you have to examine the character of the one who's being accused. The one who's being accused is God. The one who's being accused is us. But the accuser also must be examined. Jesus' life was a revelation of God's character, but his death was a revelation of Satan. I got to keep going. Because these guys need to know what he's all about. Dad, I finished the work you gave me to do, but there is another work that I must finish. And it is to completely reveal who Satan is. That's why when we look at the cross, many of us, we always want to talk about how we see the love of God, but we do not see the hatred of sin. That's why, I'm be honest with you, that's why I can't have crosses just hanging around in a sanctuary because we become desensitized to it. It becomes a pageant. We wear it around our necks. It's pretty. But if you had seen Jesus nailed to that cross, I guarantee you wouldn't want it in the church. You wouldn't want it around your neck. We do not see sin for what it is. We want to talk about the love of God without seeing the hatred of sin. So it was important for Jesus to do this. Let's continue on. Let's continue on. Very next paragraph. It was God's purpose to place things on eternal basis of security. An eternal basis. In other words, he wasn't just trying to secure it for the moment. If he secures it for the moment, you won't have cancer. If he secures it for the moment, your car will never break down. If he's securing it for the moment, you'll never see divorce. If he's just securing things for a moment, temporary basis. But God is bigger than that. Eternal. I want to secure things on an eternal basis because let me tell you something right now. If God didn't allow things to go down on earth the way that they did, if he didn't allow sin to play its course, the universe would have gone through more. It would have been darker. It probably would have been hundreds of worlds that would have collapsed. His purpose was on an eternal basis of security. And in the councils of heaven, it was decided that time must be given for Satan to develop the principles which were the foundation of his system and government. If you don't like planet Earth, you don't like Satan's government. Don't make it God's government. It's not. He had claimed that these were superior to God's principles. Time was given for the working of Satan's principles that they may be seen by the heavenly universe. Everybody's seeing this, right? Right? Satan saw, next paragraph, Satan saw his disguise was torn away, his administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a, as a what? Murderer. I'll go to the next paragraph. I'm not sure they can read. You want to make sure you guys are reading that. There we go. There we go. I was like, why, why, people are not talking back. You, you, you weren't reading it. He revealed himself as a murderer. Murderer. 
By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. Understand this. It is not God who shed his son's blood. It is not God who murdered his. He's, it's Satan who wants all this. The accuser of the brethren. Let's go down to the next paragraph. Yet Satan was still not destroyed. The angels, the angels did not even then understand all that was involved in the great controversy. The principles at stake were to be more fully revealed. Right? And for the sake of man, Satan's existence must, be, must continue. Man as well as angels must see the contrast between the prince of light and the prince of darkness. I, she says he, I say we because I want you to know this is about everybody. We must choose whom we will serve. At the beginning of the great controversy, the angels did not understand this. Had Satan and his host then been left to reap the full result of their sin, they would have perished. But it would not have been apparent to heavenly beings that this was the inevitable result of sin. Not God, sin. A doubt of God's goodness would have remained in their minds as an evil seed to produce its deadly fruit of sin and woe. And God does not want the seed of sin to ever exist again. So you can complain all you want. Complain all you want about your child that died. Complain all you want about the job that you lost. But you don't understand that God is securing something for you that is eternal. And he's buying back something that we could never afford. He's redeeming us where we'll get back that which we've lost and we'll get what we could have never earned on our own. And that's what God wants to give to you. He scratches the redeem code. And it's his number. And he'll do whatever it takes for you to see who God is and to also reveal who Satan is. So church family, what is your choice? I'm going to invite the praise team to come forward. This song should have so much more meaning for us. Amen. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus was saving you from something worse. That cross, as evil as it is, was saving us from something worse. So that we could have the eternal security. Do you want that? Let's stand to our feet, church family, as we sing this song. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Amen. 
Our scripture and benediction prayer comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 through 18. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen. For our troubles, they're just momentary. But God is working something out for us that is everlasting. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but we fix our eyes what is unseen. For what is seen is just temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Father God, thank you so much for reminding us of that special, special redemption story. That you took it to the courtrooms. That you satisfied all of the legal ramifications and demands. Whatever the accuser came, whatever he said we deserve, you took upon yourself. You were the branch that was burned in the fire, so we didn't have to burn in that fire. And yes, by your stripes we are healed. We can see those stripes and know what sin causes, what sin brings, and we don't want any part of it anymore. You have redeemed us from the falsehoods, the lies. And so we come into your glory, we come into your beautiful presence, seeing you for who you are, and now seeing the enemy for who he is. So we choose you today. And we are going to come back here next week and celebrate the victory of your resurrection. Through the ordinance of communion and baptism and song, we just can't wait. Our victory is nigh. Thank you so much. We are redeemed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you.